Hi. So our guest presenter, Mr. Frank Hughes, retired as NASA Chief of Space Flight Training. His address will be highlighting training and accomplishments of astronauts during the Apollo and shuttle programs. His extensive NASA career began in 1966 while he was involved with the Apollo simulators as an instructor with special expertise in the Apollo guidance computers. He has been involved with every manned space flight since that time. When leaving NASA as chief of the space flight training division, Mr. Hughes headed an organization responsible for all shuttle and space station training. After leaving NASA, Hughes joined Titronics, I guess that's how you pronounce it, Software Incorporation, where his responsibilities include the development of new technologies for training and education, including VR, AR, and mixed reality training. Hughes retired as president of Titronics in 2021. He is currently working on a book highlighting his experiences throughout his career. And he told me that he was going to tell some funny stories. So take it away, Frank. Okay, well, thank you, thank you Alex. It's uh, great to be here. I guess it was a couple of years ago we were here. And um, what I want to do is, uh, first of all, um, let's see if I can share my screen. Okay, have you got it there? Yes, we got it. Okay, good. Yep. There you go. I want to do a couple of things. Um, one for sure is I, I like to do it as a training uh, simulation kind of talk. I want to make sure that if there's a question, just ask him right then. It's, it's easier for me and to you maybe to bring a notice to what's going on. So if there's something that troubles you or you just have a question, uh, find a way to interrupt with me. Uh, <clears throat> Jack or Alex, either one of you, <clears throat> just flag me down and I'll stop and we'll go on and do this thing. What we do want to do is, is talk about the history of simulators. And, and I'm going to go to the next page, first page here. It's an interesting thing. We, we were, many of you are not even aware when all this stuff went on, but 1958 is when NASA was formed out of the NACA, which was an earlier federal organization. And uh, at that time, it was kind of interesting because we didn't know the skills that would you need to fly in space. We didn't know what knowledge would be needed to fly in space and what attitudes and attitudes like safety and all the kind of things. It, it pretty much, it's easy to think that, so. but we needed to change and find ways to do things quickly. When you think about all of this stuff, it, it's really important that what's going on up till now, the United States, NASA, and pretty much everywhere else, the only trains they were doing, the training was for aircraft flying. And in fact, when you talk about research or training or design airplanes, the only thing you could think about is wind tunnels. Nobody knew how to do anything other than that. So along the way, during World War II, uh, your friend over there in Binghamton <clears throat> came up with the uh, with the uh, blue box, the trainer that began the idea of how to turn out airplane pilots, and that was pretty much all that was going on. So along the way, we decided to do uh, the first organization organized um, piloting thing. Mercury is a one airplane, one person in each spacecraft, <clears throat> start in 58, ended in 63. The objectives were pretty simple. We made six ordered flights. Two of them were suborbital, four were orbital. And the idea, the objectives were to orbit around a spacecraft in a, around the Earth, and then investigate the ability to function in space. And we didn't even know if you could eat in space, for example. We don't want to make sure in any way, then we want to recover both the person and the spacecraft safely. Now, Mercury, this very first one, uh, I've told you some other time, but it was very small. And in fact, the shoulders are almost touching the walls of the spacecraft. 
And the joke at the time, I wasn't there yet. I was still in college myself, but it was um, that you wore it. You didn't, you know, the, what's going on? There was, this is how simple it was for the control panel. There was less than a hundred switches in the whole thing. There was no computer in Mercury, not at all, okay? And to figure out whether you were going forward or backward, you'd look out the window and if the earth is coming, if the earth is running towards you, that means you're running forward. If it's going away from you, you're probably going backwards. The simulator, the first thing that they came in is actually cobbled out of a bunch of pieces from an old uh, fighter jet. It was a F-86 simulator. That, and that was interesting because it was all analog computers. This is a computer, but it was analog. And the whole idea that you're going on, you'd have one person over here as the instructor and one student pilot astronaut in here. That was all there was. When you went through that stuff, you can see how tight the Mercury spacecraft was and so on. And the simulators all had to reflect how complex the spacecraft was. So Mercury uh, was built by McDonnell Douglas actually the Douglas program, I'm going to call later McDonnell Douglas. And so they also built a simulator. But what they did is they gave a contract to link simulators in Binghamton. And this vehicle was built in St. Louis, but it was done for McDonnell. Now there were those four flights, two flights, I'm sorry. This was a Redstone. So the guy in here, the flight was only 15 minutes. It was basically just like an artillery show. You fired it up to a couple hundred miles, and they came down 15, the total flight is 15 minutes. And then the four other flights, we flew the first one with uh, John Glenn was with a, another weapon, that is, this is, a, this is an Atlas spacecraft. And they put the thing up, the first flights were only four and a half hours, three flights around the earth and so on. And then it got more and more complex to the point of the last flight of the four was done, it was uh, 30 hours. So he stayed up more than a day. Interesting thing that people don't think about though, that this was the Mercury simulator, I'm sorry, the Mercury spacecraft control center. It was in Florida at first. Later it was moved when we, uh, Houston, the spacecraft center there was built. But you remember the days when up in here, you could only talk to the astronauts when they were over one of these tracking sites. And so, if the line came inside their circle, you could talk to them until it went out. Okay, let me go back a notch here. Anyway, this is this was a big change to the way we did business, but it's kind of the way we did when we were flying X-15s or other X airplanes going along. Okay. Now Gemini came along. That was in 65, 66. And you, some of you might know of this one. It had two people. Now the whole thing, we, President Kennedy said we were going to go to the moon. So these steps along the way were supposed to be Mercury and then it was Apollo. But along the way, after we went through the things that we learned in, in Mercury, they said we have to have another system, something, because we had to learn a lot of things like rendezvous and so on, and a lot of things about computering. So this is a this was a two-person spacecraft. We flew 10 manned flights in 65 and 66. When I joined NASA, it was just after uh, uh, Gemini 8 and before Gemini 9, 9. So that's the first one that I actually worked on. The digital computer on here, and we did have a digital now, it had a, a monster memory of 4K, okay, but that, machine was allowed to compute and display rendezvous solutions and things like that. We had a really good environmental control system. It was good for up to 14 days. And the reason is 14 days could be some of the downstream flights to the moon. And it had two fuel cells, two uh, hydrogen oxygen that would, uh, fuel cells that would generate enough power for uh, th that flight of about 10 to 14 days. And it had 200 switches and controls. Now it's interesting, think about that. This is, I don't expect for you to read this or see it, 
But if you can find these things that are scattered around the country in museums, you can see what it was. There's two redundant control systems, one on each side. And they, the simulator, when I first got there, the first day I was there, they put me inside that Mercury, I'm sorry, the Gemini simulator. So I got to fly without knowing anything. They were just telling me what to do, but it gave me a real insight to what's going on. This is what that simulator looked like. It's also spacecraft is built by uh, Douglas. And so the Binghamton got the, the uh, contract to build this thing. And you can see the way the two people fit in here. And this is uh, my original boss was the guy on the left. I'm sorry, on the right. On the left is John Young and Gus Grissom. And uh, those few astronauts, we spent a lot of years with um, all of that to get this thing ready or to fly. This is a different crew. This is uh, Wally Shira and, uh, and uh, Tom Stafford. So you can see how you fit in here. It's very tight and uh, really complex in terms of anything that went on before. This is, they could see that they could reach up and throw circuit breakers, which is what's in there, just like you would find the circuit breakers in your airplane. We also started doing something different. We realized that the operations out the side of the spacecraft is really important. So we started doing zero G training with a, a big airplane. This is a KC-135 and they put a mock-up in there. And then by flying parabolas up in the sky, you would be able to give somebody about 20 seconds of zero gravity at a time. And uh, that, that, that was a big change to how we're doing business. Mercury did none of that. Uh, Gemini didn't do anything until the late versions of it. This is a spacecraft taken off. This is a, this is a um, Titan spacecraft, another weapon. And when you got to orbit, this is some views. We did a couple of flights as its own, 10. But one of the flights, six and seven, we uh, flew people up for 14 days and stayed up there for 14 days. And then a Gemini 6 came up and rendezvoused with them. So we were able to see these pictures, which just wouldn't have happened any other way because all the other spacecraft were up there by themselves. This is a, a really good picture, give you an idea of the size of the thing once in orbit. The white piece in the back was where all the systems were, the fuel cells and another uh, breathing oxygen and so on. And now think about the simulator that you have to build to get you to do this. So in this case, you had to learn how to fly, how to rendezvous, how to get close to vehicles and fly in formation, but you also had to learn all the systems. Remember those 200 switches and controls. Now you had to really become familiar with what that's all going on and do that. By this time, at the end of 66, um, the Spacecraft Center in Houston was up and running. So this was a, a thing during Gemini 8. The picture shows that they're doing a rendezvous. And that was the first time we got a successful rendezvous up in space to that Agena, that spacecraft you saw a little bit ago. But the fact is, is that it's, it's so, how can I say, infantile, the way we are. The fact is, is those five XY plotters are there, okay? Because in real time, during a spacecraft flight, spacecraft right has up here coming toward the California coast, we could not change the range in real time. So they had set up with this, this one had, um, what would be a range like out to 500 miles, and this one would be 100 miles, and this would be down 20 miles, this is down five miles and so on. And what you got into is that um, the, the spacecraft, although it's marvelous, the people on the ground were chasing along, trying to keep every, everything to be uh, helpful to it up in space. Okay, we got through all of that stuff. And then in 67, we started Apollo spacecraft. Uh, the goals here were interesting. First of all, the goals went way beyond landing people on the moon and returning safely to the Earth, although that was the number one goal. But we wanted to establish the technology to make sure other, we would make sure that our national interest was preeminent across all the rest. We wanted to make sure that we could uh, make a program of exploration on the moon. 
and we did a pretty good job on that. And we developed man's capability to work in the lunar environment. Now, Mercury simulator was really simplistic. The Gemini was better, but it was still a really simple machine. But now, when it came time, we had to go through, here's our two systems, two spacecraft, the command modules and the lunar module. That they flew 11 manned missions between 68 and 72. Same digital computer on each one. It was built by uh, uh, MIT's instrumentation laboratory. And it, they, they were up to 36K of memory. And the same computers were there with different software. The software for the LEM was obviously very different than what you did on the command module. But that environmental control system was really good. It would do the 14 days without any effort. And three fuel cells, because you'd need a lot of power. Then there were 350 switches and controls in the command module, 200 in the LEM. Okay? The, the change is so much. This is the relative size of the two spacecraft. You can see where the three people ride up to the moon and then the two of them get in the lunar module and land. But think about what was going on so quickly because the Mercury was so tiny down here. Gemini wasn't a whole lot better. And then suddenly had these huge things where you had 60 foot long spacecraft. And of course, the big change was this was a, a weapon, the Mercury spacecraft. Titan was a weapon also that was pressed into service, scavenging people. And here's the first spacecraft that was not a weapon. Saturn V was built where the people flew up here and down here behind it was where we, we got into uh, the, the lunar module, stowed. So that was, that was a pretty big deal. This is like the command module uh, control panels. You can see there's lots and lots of things to do. And of course, lots of switches and controls control all those various complex systems. This is the inside and lunar module. And if you notice the two windows where you're standing, there are no seats in the lamp, you just stood there. And that's what this, these wires about because you, you were actually on a upside down par, uh, parachute harness so that you tied down to the ground. This is the trip to the moon. I don't want to get into the details of it, but to go to the moon, you really, didn't aim for the moon. You just did a long maneuver down here at the bottom, down here. You made a long burn and changed from your speed around the earth of 25,000 feet per second to a, a much greater 36,000 feet per second. And that just what caused you to go in a very long, very skinny ellipse. That if nothing else had happened, you had free return back to earth, okay. But the thing is, as it did this, the moon was over here so that when you launched, the moon would come and tour and keep it torn until finally you get close, it would warp these trajectory around and you would slow down back in the back here, this lunar orbit insertion maneuver. And then you might up stay in orbit. This is down in Florida. This is a set of simulators. The green ones are from the, are the lunar module and the brown ones were, were the uh, command module. And if you look at it, this one, the, the picture is taken from one of those brown ones. The photographer's up here on top of here. So there were actually three of these. This is LMS-2, LMS-1 was in Houston. I'm standing here on CMS-2, and this down here is CMS-3. And uh, we were, had these extra simulators because there was so much training to be done, there were a lot of things that we had to get done in terms of different crews at different times and so on. By the way, I wanted to talk into, this as you can see the instructors here, there were three, four, five instructors at a time. There's another set of instructors over here working on this console. The console itself has gotten more complicated, but I want to bring thing this X. This is, this is a landing system, this is a piece of equipment that showed video scenes from the moon surface. And then all of them, all of these complex things were the optics were built by a group, some of you may know, Ferrand Optical. And they, they built this folded optic systems so that you'd mix video and reflections from the star balls and all kinds of things. And we'll go to the next one. 
This is the CMS2. This is the first one. So you can see, get a, just a picture of the bottom here, shows all of the instructor uh, things. Every time you see is a switch, you saw the position of that switch inside the cockpit. And that was what they did. The astronaut crews would climb up the stairs and slide in to the command module. So it looked inside there as much as we can, like the real deal. And then each one, there were four windows that you looked out into the optical system on each side. And they were independent things so that you could see a different picture from this side of the spacecraft as you would from this one. You might be, the earth is down on this side and out here you're looking out into space. Next one. Another picture of that uh, complex thing. You can see there are eight balls that is, you can see how it's going, what's going on, and then all these switches. And it took a while as an instructor to get to know those devices. By the way, just for the hell of it, this is a group of instructors and the skinny guy over here on the far right is me back in 1968. So you see everybody was in the white shirts and skinny ties and all that sort of thing. That was the way we lived. Now, this is a view inside the, the command module simulator. This is Apollo 10 crew. So now it's Tom Stafford, John Young, and Gene Cernan. And you can see that they're on the, the, this, looking through the door where they would have had to climb into the real vehicle. And then the next flight, the next picture, I'm sorry, shows that John Young has turned around here and he's looking or talking to each of these people. And down in here, there's a set of text at telescope and sextant. The uh, telescope was 60 power. The uh, sextant was, I'm sorry, the sextant was 60 power. The telescope was like a finding scope. It just pointed at, at a star or some kind of on the moon that he wanted to take pictures or measure or so on. So this, this is an important thing. The lunar module, same kind of thing. Nobody in here. You saw the picture. Here's the triangle windows where you look at when you're landing. And then down here is a big door that you use to open up and get out. Okay. This is one of the astronaut groups. This is Pete Conrad and Al Bean on Apollo 12. And if you could see up here, the lunar module has a telescope also. Uh, it's interesting. In order to line up stars, whoop, I didn't want to go back up there. They would, uh, they would uh, put together this thing and point at a star and there's a button over on this side and you'd click it and that would tell that that's star like uh, Polaris or you know, any of the major things of let's say the major stars in the, in the belt of Orion and so on. We would take that and then it would, the computer would record the angles and would line up the platform and so on. We would do some training with the suits on right here. And so the simulator, was made so we put all the all of the uh, gases into the spacecraft so the guy can live, work, like in there, do whatever. Next one. That's another simulator. This is LMS one in um, in Houston. Same kind of deal. This thing is changing by itself. Forgive me. Anyway, you get the idea. This is this was a generic view of the moon, and there was a XY plotter, a huge thing that would move two cameras around, one for each of the forward windows, so you could see where you're going. Now, the thing is, the moon is hung upside down because otherwise it would gather up dust. So when the, the cameras are looking up and the moon would come down to the cameras, there was extension right here. And the way it worked, it was, it was very, very great view. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Of course, here backwards, it's where I would be if I was on the lamp simulator. You can even see this guy with a skinny tie. Anyway, as the flights got more and more complex, we get into a thing. This is, this is Apollo 12 again, and you can see when they were going to the, uh, <laughs> when they're going to the moon, we were going to do it. The first flight was Apollo 11, and all they did is land and then take off, okay? They only stayed outside for two and a half hours, very, very quick, grab some rocks and get out of there, demonstrate we could do it. But on 12, 
which was in November of 1969, we were going to do a, a very tight, controlled, split-second uh, landing so that you could land near this spacecraft here on a 30-degree slope. And it, it was a spacecraft that had been put together by JPL. It was called Surveyor. Four of these flew in the moon, landed. This one did a pretty good job. This is being in, in, uh, in Conrad. And they wanted to land next to it. On top of that, they cut off a piece of cable that had been embedded with some uh, germs. They wanted to see if that ger those germs survived being out in space uh, for three years in this case, bring it back. And as soon as they put it in a good medium, warmed it up, those damn bugs were active again. So it's so there's a, a lot of other spacecraft out there and a lot of other ent uh, entities, I guess we'd say, that we still haven't gone on. But this training, you can see, even using mock-ups like this, where we're trying to make this thing as, as good as possible, as safe as possible, but still moving forward. This is Apollo 14. Uh, we had trouble with the moon uh, putting the flag up on Apollo 11. Then uh, we never landed on 13. 12 did a good job, 13. Anyway, we added, just wanted to show you that we spent some time putting up the flag, uh, just make sure that they could do it. Because it turns out the soil was only six inch, maybe a foot thick around the moon. But many times it had a hard pan underneath it so that uh, it did it. We had to make sure that it was at least 75 feet away from the limb. Apollo 11, we put it up successfully, but when they took off, the blast of gas from the ascent stage right here blew down the flag. All the other flags are okay, but not that one. There's a lot of other things for Apollo 15, 16, 17. We had to build simulators. At this, this is the rover. This is just an electric version of what happened, but this is a 1G version, so we could move around. The building where all those simulators is, so here behind this guy. So they, we had terrain and work, uh, working areas, but just dirt tracks that we'd move around and go from place to place. And then we'd park in a place, the geologists would set up a thing, so to get out of the out of the rover and dig up some rocks, to do these kinds of things. And when they did this, they were also talking to the uh, people back in Houston, Mission Control. So we had a good thing going on. But of course, that whole Kennedy Space Center area is a big swamp. So we had something going on with Apollo 16. This is John Young over here with the red stripe on his helmet. That's so we can all tell which one is which. <clears throat> and he said one day, sorry, um, Houston, this is Apollo 16. Would you call the uh, Florida uh, Parks and Wildlife people? And everybody didn't know what the hell to do, but said, okay. So actually, we on the instructor station called quick and called over because they were sitting there. We were, here we are with the most advanced United States system can be at the moment. And they had a problem with this. <laughs> that that a big elevator was just sleeping across this whole road. And so they went and somebody showed up in a truck, walked up with a rope, threw it around the back end of the thing, and woke them up, made them move off the road. And then our, you know, super sophisticated bunch of people can move on down the road, keep on training. But you can see that these things have been around since the geology, or ge since the, you know, dinosaurs were here. And, Put them to a dead stop. Another thing we did, this is a, a real picture taken from a limb. Remember, there was an a astronaut up there by himself while the two were on the ground each time. So this was a picture taken of an area called Hadley Rill. And this, you should go out tonight, or not tonight, I guess, but sometime soon, and try to find this. It's in the upper left quadrant. It was close to center on the moon, but it's it's really an interesting thing. It's, it's actually a, 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 a pipe or a tube, a lava tube that was uh, collapsed along the way. So the geologists wanted to go in this area. This is, Hadley, this is Mountain Hadley. They would come in and land 
in this area. Well, the next step we had to we had to do better job because the generic uh, maps were not good enough. So here's a picture taken again from the thing. You can see this is we've named all these craters like this is elbow crater because of the turn here, and they named all these other uh, things. We went and had the uh, Defense Mapping Agency create, this is a thing, this is 12 by 20 foot map, the thing, the three dimensions. So we could see this thing. We're gonna land over here by Mark and Luke, those creators. So then to give you a scale, this is two of my friends, instructors that were just working out each other, more to give you scale or anything else. We take that thing and slide in underneath that landing site so that the we could land on it. And and we did that. Then you had to make sure that the, the angle of the sun was okay so that you could give the right shadow effect because we came in generally where the sun was be 10 degrees up from uh, between eight and 10 degrees after sunrise. And if that all worked right, the astronaut commander could see the views like this, okay? That actually you could see that here's elbow over here and you could see that same turn and the rill going this way. And they came down and they land right here. Did you get an idea? By the way, the computer on board was calling the shots and these numbers, the guy in the right seat, the pilot was reading out, it would say like 535. And he'd, he'd say, that this is where the spacecraft is going. And so the commander could, could knock down a couple of clicks and redesignate where he was going to go. And right now, I happen to know that they did a couple more and wind up over in this area. But it's, it's a fascinating thing that we went, did this over a couple of months, got things turned around. You could never get that done in, in these days. Now Skylab came along. It was a really big change because we had learned a lot about flying in space and everything, but we did not know some of the really most important things. Uh, <clears throat> so we built a laboratory inside a surplus S4B, or the third stage of Saturn V, and it's 513. That would have been uh, would have been used for um, Apollo 17. No, no, Apollo 18. I mean, we have three, we had three more Saturns. We used this one. The other two were never used. It's a crime. All we have to do is launch them, just fuel them up and launch. So there's one of them in Houston, 514, and one at Huntsville, Alabama, is 515. We could have easily flown and had uh, two more landings on the moon. We flew three crews on this Skylab. It's our first space station. And it was between 73 and 74. We flew 28 days, 56 days in E4, four, eight, 12 weeks. We performed a hell of a lot of science, engineering, and medical studies. And for the first time, we haven't got into this too much. We had the first time we had a private bathroom because everything you did has been in public up till now. That's part of what my book is about is how do you know, people ask, how do you go to the bathroom? Of course, the answer is very carefully. Uh, this is a look, and this is Saturn V. You can see this, but up here, that third stage is actually the, uh, the spacecraft that's been modified to be our station, space station. Inside that third stage, which had a couple of floors added to it, and there was all the supplies and everything that didn't need to get there. Even had a shower, yet three places, places where you could sleep, and there was one place to go to the bathroom. Pete Conrad here, we've seen Pete a lot along the way, but he, he was moving right ahead. Different things, different experiments, all kinds of things. Our big problem with our simulator now is that see he's standing on a device, get some things out of this one. But the fact is, this is he's standing inside this thing. And because it's made with to be used in zero gravity, we had a a motor to turn on and you would turn around. So the piece that you want to get to was back here is on the bottom of it. So people could do work. This was true up and this one up here and over here too. 
So this is the part of the simulator uh, that got the crew ready to fly. This, in this case, the crew, first crew that went, is was working. There was a uh, huge a set of uh, solar telescopes. You mentioned that how the sun was doing this. This, in this case, the first time we saw human eyes outside the atmosphere, saw the uh, prominences and everything going on. So this is this guy is sitting there running this Apollo telescope, we call it. And the other guys are running systems to make sure that we give them. Of course, we're doing like always giving malfunctions in the in the thing. So this is just a different view. You can see this is the spacecraft systems over here. And Ed Gibson is running with uh, with uh, Jerry Carr. And this was the third crew that spent uh, 12 weeks up there. Again, they're doing a lot of coordination. We were giving them malfunctions, so on like that. We also had a bunch of Earth resources things. And this is, this is an important deal because uh, in this case, it, uh, Oh, uh, he's looking, he's tracking sites on the ground. So we took a bunch of, we had telescopes that were focused on the ground for Earth resources. And a lot of the, the satellites we use today, they did the basic research through there to see how we could get a, what we'd learn about the Earth's surface. Now there, this is a telescope that was put in on the anti-solar thing. This is pointing out here, away from the sun, so they could take a lot of pictures. This is what the thing looked like if it was put together. Unfortunately, during launch, uh, part of the thing was screwed up. One of these solar rays was ripped off and this one was stuck, but the crew go out EVA and fixed it, it got it all going. But you could see that when it went away, well, the, uh, it tore off a solar shade back here. So we brought up and put out two versions of it a shade to cover the side of the spacecraft. With it not there, the temperature was 130 degrees or so inside the vehicle. But with these things on, it got down to a pretty comfortable 75 to 80 degrees. Now, what did we learn from Skylab? First of all, that maintenance and repair could be trained. We could do, show that flight is possible, that, is, that we should be planned to do with maintenance. We could plan to train crews in a simulator that doesn't exactly look like the real vehicle, okay? So you could do part task training instead of full task. I also realized that only time critical events needed to be trained with repetitive, like Dan Ballet, you had to make sure that's launch and landing certainly has to be that. But there are a lot of other things that could be done in a more relaxed environment. And timelines could be use the crew to set their own pace and find like job jars, we used to call it for tasks that they might do when they have time. That became a big change in the way. Uh, the good thing about it is what we're getting for the space station we have now. Uh, if you have any questions, I haven't heard anything. I'm gonna keep going quick here. Okay. All right. Uh, All right. There was a detente between the USSR and NASA. And, and, and so Nixon and Brezhnev signed a protocol to fly a flight. We did it in July. 1975. It's called the Apollo Soyuz Toys. It's called it that here. In Russia, it's called the Soyuz Apollo flights. But there you go. It's successful because it showed that we could have an androgynous docking system that was possible. And that system looked like this. It's the same sex on both sides. And we were able to prove it out that we could fly up with our vehicle and then dock with the one from Russia. This is the crew that flew it. We, they had, there was two Russians in, uh, sorry. It's got its own idea of what it wants to do. A Vance Brand and Tom Stafford, Deke Slayton, finding on his first flight. And then the two Russians, this is Alexei, Alexei, oh, Alex, how about that? Alexei Leonov and uh, Valery Kubasov. So this is our first real flight. It broke the way we had to do things like we want to do. This is the crew inside the command module sim simulator and ready for all of it. Oh, we'll get back to that. And here inside the Soyuz simulator in Russia. This is inside the docking module that you use it 
and uh, it worked very, very well. This is after one simulation. Maybe you've seen the picture of the command module simulator. Here they are uh, talking about what's going on. This was the last time we used this simulator when we did this flight in 1975. This all became extra st extraneous stuff, and these were all junk, which I really feel sorry about. This is an interesting picture because this is American, these two are Americans, and then this guy's a Russian one, this guy's a Russian one. And they're all, the biggest problem is we did lots of really good training, but in all of these things, we had to figure out which one is the KGB guy. I happen to know that it was right here. Most time we'd have somebody that's coming along and they'd have no, uh, they didn't have anything to say about the spacecraft or the- I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, on the simulators for the Soyuz and the Apollo, did the Americans, like, did you as the instructors work on the Soyuz? No. Simulators? No, they had their own instructors. The crew would go over there. Uh, one of us would go with them to make sure the quality of the, the, the uh, training was done was done well and nothing said in, in, uh, wrong or incorrect. Or about the American systems. Okay, but, thanks. Okay, and then that's not true when we got to the ISS for the International Space Station. Then we do have instructors stay over there some of the time. In fact, it's coming just very shortly. I'll talk about that. But that, that's a really good question. But you can see we have, this guy's one of our instructors and the other ones around. It's one of my good friends, Bob Payne, all this stuff. And then they would go back over and we'd have a similar kind of things. Anyway, this is the Soyuz ready to launch. In fact, it, it, you can't tell, but it's the way they watch it, it's, it's ready to go there. And here's our, uh, this is taken up in a, a smaller Saturn 1B. There's the Soyuz up there when we rendezvous. And then the other picture we can see uh, taken from the Soyuz, from our spacecraft. And you can see the docking module here. So we put those two together. We stayed up for three days together and then so on. But what do we learn here is really interesting. Space rescues could be done. Training with two languages, two training philosophies and two sets of training hardware is difficult, but and the time required to do it expands. Okay. And then the joke here but how to pick up the training was how to pick up the KGB agents. Now, the shuttle, you guys are all alive through all this stuff. The goal here was to, to create a usable, reusable spacecraft, move cargo from the Earth into orbit cheaper and more reliable, and then increase the creature comforts of the spacecraft and create the infrastructure to build a station and go further from the Earth. And we pretty much did that. But now the shuttle, we had five digital computers forming a set that when you're doing launch or entry, they all work together with four of them as the primary computers and a single one doing flying backup software. Same algorithms, but different programmers, just so there's no uh, fault that would take down all of the primary machines. It's a fly-by-wire machine controlling the spacecraft, three fuel cells and environment control. It folds over time, so you could be up there for just about as long as you have uh, energy and power. Hydraulics were controlled to control the uh, rudder, elevons, and everything. Really advanced hydrogen, oxygen main engines, and a reusable heat resistant tiles, rather than the single use tiles that we had on a follow in the early flights. To give you an idea how complex the vehicle would be, in this case, there were hundreds and hundreds of things. In fact, something like 1300 switches and controls in the cockpit. And it's about the same thing on ISS, except now many of them are controlled through the software. That's not a physical switch. The shuttle was built on three floors. So you had a flight deck, which is a picture you just saw. And then down here, you'd have a mid deck, which is where you sleep, eat, go to the bathroom. And then underneath, you didn't do much down here. But this was uh, low equipment and uh, environmental control things and things like that. 
I wanted to bring a couple of things. So we talked a lot about simulators, but training kept going on. And you could see that if you bail out of the shuttle, this orange thing, that's called the color you use for rescue, okay? Because you might have to jump out. This was not true for the first 25 flights, but after Challenger, everybody wore a thing like this. And you could see, here's, this is a backpack. That's actually a, a, what am I trying to say? Parachute, sorry, it's a parachute. Down here you have radios and uh, some water tied in like this. You have communications, all this sort of thing. Then there's also a, a boat in here, a May West and so on. May West so you could have flotation. So there's a couple of things. If you land successfully, but you couldn't get out, maybe there's gases, dangerous. You had to, this is one of my instructors now showing, this is actually happens to be um, John Glenn learning how to rappel down the side of the vehicle. Because when it gets home, it's physically hot. Okay, you just had 3000 degrees up here and you have to make sure that you don't burn the restaurant. This is how you'd bail out. This, is, this fella is ready to jump through there, but it's like a pole that ex extend the length of it, pull it a lanyard and it goes down. If you jump out right here, you'd fly right into the front of the wing. So you want to go under there. And then, anyway, you'd come out. This we practiced in the water pool just so we could do that. And then you got a chance to feel like it to be in a parachute without actually doing a parachute because we want to have, we don't want to have any of our expensive astronauts get broken. Okay. And then once you're in the water, he's what you can see this is a boat. He's got his May West out. So he's shoved off of the parachute. And these guys are just safety. You see, he's not doing anything. He's talking to them, instructors. In this case, then. You could haul yourself up into this little boat and tie yourself in because the water's cold in two thirds of the earth. Okay. And so you get up in here and your body is sort of getting warmer because you're inside this waterproof suit. Get in here and you'd still keep your helmet on. You might open it up, but you can give you some pretty good thing. And anyway, that all of that stuff is packed into that orange suit. Weighed about 100. 70 pounds when you're standing around there. You want to be careful not to fall over. You could be like a turtle. You couldn't turn over. And this other thing we did for the shuttle is we had to, and we use it today, is we built a huge um, water tank. This is um, 200 feet, 220 feet by 100 feet, and it's 40 feet deep. So that you could have big parts of the of the space station so that you could get out. And but during the assembly phase, we could put all these things together. Meanwhile, since it's all built, they were just working on this installation of, of spare parts, new spare parts, or uh, experiments going on outside. This give you an idea. It's, it's all water. It's so clean. You can see how clean it is. But that 40 feet, you can see the sides of the thing going up to up here. Interesting things you don't think about is that, uh, I don't want to go there yet. Um, when we first got in the ground, we had two uh, bridge cranes so we could lower a piece into an outer water. And the astronauts got in there and they suddenly they were feeling like they're being shocked. Turns out that the building is so huge that if there was an electro, electrical storm nearby to build up electric charges, we had a uh, wire round cables to lower things up and down. And we had to get everybody out of the pool and then rewire those bridge cranes with, with non-conducting material. Okay, Because otherwise you were actually putting electricity into the water. It's little things you don't think about. Most of that is from scale. Also the shuttle, people had a loon and we had um, two kinds of astronauts, pilot types and then mission specialist type. The pilots, had to use that simulators to work on a deal where you'd fly in, this is a track on the ground where you go. And then when you get close to the landing, you would make a, a circle on this 20,000 foot diameter, uh, radius, I'm sorry, thing, and then come off there and touch down here, okay? So it's all 
part of the game to make sure that you could make it so easy to fly home. This is the John Young and Bob Crippen in that spacecraft to get the idea. Other view, just get the idea. This is in the simulator. It is a crew mascot, all kinds of things. It's check, checklists all over the place and so on. So the simulators kept getting more and more complex to the point where this is, this took a whole building to, hand, to handle two of them, it took everything. This is a, well, this is a person you know, maybe this, this is um, Eileen Collins. She was born in the Elmira area, I think. And so she's uh, one of your local astronaut people. And she was uh, our first job, she flew as a pilot and then she flew as a commander on STS-26, the first flight after the Challenger accident. She was a hell of a pilot. Of course, the launch, you saw them all big things. These things are not, this is 123 feet long and the cargo is 60 feet by 15 feet. So you could pick, it's like a big truck to space. And we stopped flying it back in 2011 and it breaks my heart to even think about it. There's more going on. Over the years, over 30 years, we evolved into really highly proficient things, complex vehicles and experiments, increased training time, long time periods increase by flight cost. In other words, if you have a long train period, then the cost goes up. Let me go back. Flight delays cost too, because the meter keeps running, just like anything else. You still have to train all the astronauts, pay them, and all the, the, the instructors and so on. So that's a major deal. Now, along the way, when we were flying shuttle, what you didn't know is we get into this thing where we flew and rendezvoused with a mirror. We did nine flights where we went up and docked with the mirror. It started in, it was started in 1986, but we went up in the 90s. And over seven months, we took a lot of picture people up there but this is what the mirror looked like. It's much smaller. In fact, if you look at it, you can see that the shuttle was as big as the whole mirror's rotation. They did a first meeting when the commanders finally got together and so on after we docked. And there's a lot of pictures like this, just to give an idea of the Russians done in the first, except this is, this is our NASA. Uh, I can draw a blank on her name. Shannon Lucid, right here. And then the guys that came up on the, on the shuttle. Okay, what did we learn? Training two countries, two languages, still real difficult. The Ahmed, uh, more complex systems going on. Procedures in two language. A whole body of medical data was obtained and still be analyzed. So there's all kinds of things like that. Well-trained crews, We'll have all kinds of problems. they will be unanticipated. We had several fires in the mirror and a progress uh, was coming up, flown by Russians in the ground. Anyway, they collided with the thing and so we lost one vehicle, uh, one part of this beer space station. Anyway, the ISS, that's our space station. It's going on. Background is that we've trained for the ISS we set a whole new goals and challenges, but now we've got 16 nations involved from Europe, Japan, Canada, Russia, and the United States with 11 different languages. So the construction provides 41 uh, space shuttle flights, 12 Russian assemblies, and many, many uh, Soyuz and other flights to ferry crew members and supplies. The training is going on. There's so many things going on. There's six control centers, seven training sites all around the earth. There's just lots of stupendous kind of things to do it. The training flow initially takes almost four and a half years. We try to get it down to 18 months and we managed to do that. Just the steps, so it was built. This was over the time as more pieces came up, stretched it out until fine. It's actually bigger than this now. This stage with this picture 
thing weighed more than a million pounds in orbit. It's about 250 miles up and so on. And any of you probably have seen it go by. There's several good websites that you can actually check and find out what time it's going to be available, especially when you're out one of your uh, star parties. It would be fun to let the uh, people see the uh, ISS come over. The simulators on the ground now look like this. They were copies of the vehicle. I mean, they're just huge. Inside, it looks like this. Well, this is a, this is a zero G flight. You can tell that, by, first of all, because it's like this. And also, you notice anybody, you can see where their feet are. They're either grabbing by an arm or they've got their toes underneath the, these rebel bands that we find. And we have to do a lot of exercise all the time. This is Nicole Stott, who's just on a treadmill going along. So she has a, a, a like a, a couple of expandable forwards to hold on to her so that she won't fly away. Let's we'll go that that far. We'll open to any questions. Anybody have any questions? One. Go ahead. I hear somebody talking. If there's anybody. Yeah, go ahead. How are you, sir? Yeah, got it. My father worked on the Mercury Redstone project, uh, and his immediate supervisor, well, up the chain was Werner von Braun. My mother met Werner at the cocktail party, and he was very disappointed that the government was being cheap with the space program. And he said, good men will die from this. The second thing I'd like to add is Jeep was one of the contractors trying to develop the Mars, of, sorry, not the Mars rover, uh, the Apollo rover, or the moon rover, sorry. And they were putting so much money into it that they almost went bankrupt doing it. So. <laughs> That's happened more than one for some small companies. Boeing built that rover. So I don't know if they, that might have been that division was losing money, but they, I have to tell you that Rover was marvelous. And the biggest thing is it folded up in such a small package. And uh, in fact, I'll send some pictures. I'm writing a book and I talk all these different kinds of simulators, but also about the, the people and the funny things that happen. The Rover itself uh, was, was really a speedy thing. We never got to do as fast as we could. Apollo 16, John kind of let it go and opened it up. So he's doing like 20 kilometers an hour, you know. But it looks like because of the one sixth gravity, it was bouncing and flying through the air and, and so on. And it's, it's really good if you get in, just Google any of Apollo 16 videos of the rover, you can see what I'm talking about. Well, also have it here, but we're not gonna see that tonight. But the other thing about Mercury, it's marvelous that you're, and did he work on, uh, um, in, did he work in Huntsville or down in Florida? Uh, he worked in a, a, a Montgomery, uh, 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 Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Al, Al, Alabama. Oh, yeah. Okay. Very cool. So he was at a university kind of association. He was, uh, he was with the Air Force. Ah, there he goes. Okay, that's perfect. Good. Well, those people obviously did a hell of a job because you started from zero, zero knowledge. I mean, everywhere we turned around. Now, when we step forward, there's a lot of things we don't know very well, but you get the idea how much we do know. It's, it's interesting to me, um, when I left NASA, when we got back, we have the NASA uh, Orion simulator, and I don't have any pictures of it, simply because I haven't been down there through the COVID, but I'll, I'll fix that next time we do one of these. But um, this, I can't get to see the uh, SpaceX simulator because it's uh, proprietary, you know. Can't get to see the other one that, the, that Bezos has got going. So all of these things, it's changed so much where NASA owned everything that was flying. Now we don't. We have to make sure that they satisfy our need for safety and training 
but we don't do the training of the simulators for SpaceX or out in uh, California. And, uh, and the ones for uh, Bezos is uh, in uh, West Texas. Strange, strange world we live in. We got a but couple other because... questions in the room. Are there any questions on Zoom? Got okay, I have a question. I have two things. One, I didn't see any women um, instructors until the shuttle. Is that true? That's true. There were no instructors, no female uh, maintenance guys, instructors or anything. We started hiring in 1976. And mm -hmm. by 78, we had a few really good people. Um, but the fact is, is that in 78, then we opened up and we got the six new uh, female astronauts. Okay. <laughs> and the other thing, remember the story you told about the Palmetto? Yeah. You want to tell that story? The, the Palmetto, you're talking about the, the, the down in Florida? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned just briefly that I'm, I'm not sure how many stories I've got here, but let me do a couple of see if you can redirect me. First of all, uh, once we got those new instructors in, uh, the astronauts were pretty, uh, they treated them bad. It, it was just, you know, some men accepted women coming into the workforce real easy and others were just, just being pain in neck or some part of their body. But um, we had to just go out and I had to tell them, you go in here, you know this subject, let's say it was flight computer. So you want to go in there and tell them the story. If they give you any trouble, you just come back in here to my office. You don't cry out there. You can, you can cry in here, not out there. But you tell me who I've got a problem and I'll go talk to them directly. You know, because we had to change the whole set of what's going on out there. And then on the other hand, I had a woman, uh, Ray Seddon, who's a real pretty girl, uh, one of those original six. And she was a, a surgeon out of uh, Murphy Brewer, Tennessee. And she was. She had two problems. One, she wanted to talk to me one day about uh, if nobody's ever flown after having a baby. And I said, that's true, you know, but that's just because it never came up. And I said, don't worry about it. You know, you, you get to fly, so do whatever you want to do. And she says, well, another thing happened. I said, I just came back from a funny meeting and uh, I have to stop. She said, they were trying to design a zero G bra. It's about a bunch of people in the engineers and the engineering stuff. And for all of you guys, some of you know, some of you don't know, when you go to orbit, first of all, whoever the laziest one in the room there, uh, your legs are incredibly strong, no matter what else. And the, but more than half of your blood is down on your legs all the time if you stand up. And so your blood, your heart, is pumping blood up to your head, but in the aorta, it just lets it fall down to the bottom thing. And you, the strong muscles in your leg are pumping the blood back up. And the varicose, the veins have little one-way valves that control the flow of blood back up to the heart. Varicose veins, or as if you have a problem where those valves don't work, they leak. But anyway, so now that's what happens. If any, you know, any astronaut, when they get to orbit, it looks like you have, they're on steroids because all of the blood uh, spreads out. So the first time you squeeze those, those tight muscles, all the blood goes to the upper part of your body, but it doesn't fall down again. It just stays there. So you get blood, the same amount of blood all the way right through. And as a side effect is that uh, your face swells up, your upper body falls up. And for women, your breasts get larger. And that was really, a big positive response, except I said, well, it all goes away when you go home. So don't get too animated with that. But anyway, so here's Ray. She's got, she's run into this, invited over to this meeting. And these guys are saying, they're working on this zero G law. And she had to look at me, let him talk to her and everything and be nice. But then she said, guys, I mean, if, if we don't have any zero gravity, then we're not going to wear them. 
you know, put two layers of clothes, layers of clothes or something, and that's it. It's just you get to be like you're a teenager again or something. So anyway, they went through all that stuff. Now, um, I did talk about the fact that the training down in Florida with the rover. There's a couple things because uh, my first flight, my first, it really excited. It was in May of of '66, uh, and I got to go out and look at it. Atlas. It was it was carrying some military payload. I don't know what it was, but it was really great. We were up at this camera stand and everything, and, and uh, three, two, one, zero, and then it just disappeared. The ball of flame spreading out, spreading out. And the guy I'm with me says, get down. Because if you looked coming across the, the thing, it's, it's all palmetto, like short palm trees. And it's just laying down with the, the blast wave coming towards you. And so we got down, nobody had got any hurt, but they sure shook the hell out of that stand we were on. And so uh, we learned later that maybe we had stayed a little further away from those uh, launches. Then the, the palmetto that, let's see, help me out, Alex, was he talking about when the training with the rover? Yes. Yes. All right, a lot of things happened. First of all, remember how it is out in the weeds and uh, we had about a half mile circuit where they would travel around and pick up rocks and do all kinds of things. And you saw that the alligator had, was asleep across the road, so let's stop it. But everywhere you turned, there were things out there that were trying to get you. I mean, they were, now they weren't really, we were in the way. They owned the place and we're the ones that were in their terrain. But as it was really, really something. In the Palmetto, they were, uh, they were uh, we would take Palmetto bugs, they're called, and it's just a big ass roach, okay? And when, remember that, you saw that beautiful, terrain looking at the moon, looking like the uh, um, Adley Rill. 3M just came out with magic tape and it was really glass because it was just about invisible. So we'd take one of these big roaches and glue it down, yeah, I mean, tape it down to the landing site so that when the crew came in the morning, it was still there and it's still trying to get away. So they came in all serious stuff, three, two, one, zero, and they'd come down and, land and then they look outside and there's this huge uh, thing with its antenna waving trying to get loose and with the magnification they were magnificent they were great <laughs> remember we're all 22 23 years old what the hell <laughs> there were a lot of other things uh al shepherd was going to knock a couple of golf balls around so we'd have a, a seven flag on the you know, sticking out of one of the craters or things like that. You know. All kinds of stuff. A lot of problems was that, uh, just on a side light, the fact is, is in Mercury, uh, we used what's called a motor moon's friend. Whenever they had to urinate, we would have something that was like a cuff. You'd put it on, and then you just pee it into a bag on your leg. And then when you got to the carrier, carrier aircraft carrier, take and dump them, you go back to normal. Well, in Gemini, we had to break that barrier. We had to do number two in space. And so the very first flight, manned flight, was with John Young and um, uh, Gus Grissom. And the whole idea was that they had to, it, it was four and a half hour flight, three, three orbits. John's only job to do was to take a poop, do number two. So they loaded him up with fiber and all kinds of, I don't know what it was. It was before I got there, you get the idea. And John, when he came back, there was a couple of things because he got in trouble. People were really upset because he had brought a corned beef sandwich with him into orbit. And the problem was, all these crumbs got loose when he took it out. He didn't, actually, he didn't know it was there. Uh, Hal Shepard had given him this sandwich, slipped him into a pocket in his suit. Fact is, Hal says, you know, this is from Wolfie's down there, it's on the beach. 
It's a deli. And he says, if I eat one of these, shaman, it, this stuff goes right through me. <laughs> and this, he says, there will be an easy job for you to do up there. Well, of course. <laughs> but on top of that, the, uh, the thing was kind of thing. You had to, I'm going to take this down. The fact is, is that the medics came up with a thing to go to the bathroom. You had to be very careful, but you had to uh, glue this thing, tape it. Now, it's some sticky stuff. You put it over your butt, okay? And then you do your business. And when you get through with it, then you'd wipe yourself as much as you could and then put all that debris inside this bag and sealed up. The problem is, as you know, anytime you've been to an outhouse, or even if, depending on what you've been eating lately, in your own bathroom, you get a lot of odor. There's a lot of gas coming out of that material. And so when you get all that done, and, and before you seal up that plastic bag, there was a, a little vial of biocide, and you had to pour it in there or squeeze it into it and into the thing, and then you seal it up. And then, now, I don't know how many age you are, as I look pretty young once I saw, but when margarine was first invented, you couldn't sell yellow margarine. You could only sell white because the butter lobby in the United States controlled that. They thought you would be confused between butter and margarine, as God knows. So you had margarine come in a little bag and then you'd break a dye, it was white, and you could knead the, the uh, thing to get rid of it and you'd, you'd make it yellow. Well, now here's, you're sitting in the spacecraft my brain was very sophisticated, but you have to take this bag with the stuff in it and you put this biocide and now you have to knead your stuff to spread that biocide around. If you didn't, it would inflate and break the bag, okay? So you think about this is all the stuff that you didn't get in the uh, astronaut recruiting posters. <laughs> uh, but anyway, John got carried away. He was hurrying because he knows that landing is coming up quick. And he squeezed the bag too hard and it broke. And so the stuff flew forward, hit the eight ball and so on and so on. So Gus, who's been bitching about this odor on this thing, now he's got more to talk about because now he'd had it live shit, if you will, spraying around the spacecraft. So they he's scraping it <laughs> off the thing, off the and thing, all this stuff. Got back. But everybody who's ever gone to space since that day has had to face this issue. <laughs> it was really bad all the time. I joke a lot of times is that anybody went to the moon, um, the guys that landed probably were constipated because they probably spent a lot of time trying not to go. Because <laughs> they had nowhere to go either. It was just a one room spacecraft, even though it's a little bigger. But so on. Now, Skylab, it's the first time I brought that attention that uh, it had a room where you go to, you had a place, some privacy, get all the stuff done that you had to do. And then that was nice. You didn't have to go through all this crap, literally, that we just had to deal with. But rather, the bag with all the unwiping things would be put into a thing and it, it was dried out. Skylab was a big medical experiment. And so when you put this in, they would dry it out and bring it home that way, you know. See, there's a lot of ways to trust, a lot of hormone changes and all the kind of stuff. Somebody gets paid to go through all that stuff and bring it home. Anyway, so that's that's one of those things you have to think about. I think we have time for, for one more question. And then if you want to tell us info about when your book will be available and the name of it and that kind of information. Sure. Another question. Oh, this me? So when is your book coming out and uh, what's the title going to be? <laughs> it's not be out before the end of the year. I would guess the first couple of months, uh, 24. And uh, it's the working title is A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. Okay. Perfect. Outstanding. Uh, it's done, uh, but it's like everything else. Now you enter a new world about publishing and people who do things that, you know, I've, I've had it edited, but now they want to do their own edit. And so on, on and on and on. I've got a lot of photos in it. 
and so on. And it's, it's a lot of fun. You saw some of them tonight, there's some others. What I will do is I'll send a picture of that plastic bag that you put on your <laughs> butt, and I'll send it to Alex and, and uh, Jack, and they can spread it around to the crowd <laughs> in a small, discreet way. <laughs> You can identify this object, it's yours. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, guys, that's good. I had a lot of fun. Thank you, Frank. That's absolutely outstanding. Thank you. All right. Take care then, thanks. Thank you, sir. All right, with that, we'll uh, close the uh, July meeting.